there had lots of research, uh, experience with research with fish, and then that ended up leading me to here, uh, where I'm pursuing my master's at the Ocean Science Center, uh, and this, in the past summer, I got a little bit of experience with fly fishing, uh, but that being said, I'm not here to tell anyone or give anyone advice about fishing, so don't ask me about that. A little bit about my presentation, um, how it's going to be structured. The first half I'll be talking about uh, data storage research, and then we'll have that information, and then I'll tell you about my own master's research. But now you might be wondering, uh, what are data storage tags? So the term data storage tag, as well as biolover, can uh, be used synonymously, so that's why I'm going to explain them both. But you might be more commonly, uh, you might know more about uh, what's known as telemetry. So biotelemetry here is when the tag is implanted into the fish and the tag itself actually uh, emits signals and then it requires a receiver to then uh, decode those signals and add date and time to see. Whereas biologging would be when you implant the tag into the fish and then it uh, measures the data and it stores it and then you need to actually retrieve the fish and the tag to then get the data back. So as I mentioned, data storage tags are tags that have sensors, which can record both physiological or environmental data. The benefit of these types of tags is that they can record continuously, as opposed to telemetry, which cannot record uh, necessarily continuously, which leads to higher resolution data. Um, however, there's a bit of a drawback, like I mentioned before, is that you need to um, actually retrieve the tag uh, to get the data back. So these tags are best used when recapture is more likely. The recent miniaturization and reduced cost of these tags has allowed data storage tags to become more popular tools for fish research. So how can they be used? One of the most common ways uh, to date that uh, data storage tags have been used is to measure the depth and temperature profiles of animals. Uh, this was first done in marine mammals really extensively, but also a paper published 2017, I actually looked at Atlantic uh, salmon pellets out of a uh, river in northern uh, Norway and out on their ocean migration and tagged them with these tags. And they got, for example, this is one individual, uh, they got the depth profile of that one individual. Something else uh, is salinity or conductivity tags. I didn't have an example for salmon of this type of tag, um, but you can imagine that those could be extremely useful as well. And another type is light-based geolocation. So this would be where the tag records um, day length and light as well as temperature, and then it could use that to, to geolocate uh, the animal. So again, this paper that was published in 2018 was out of the exact same river in northern Norway, and they tagged Atlantic salmon pelts, and then they got their uh, migratory route. So that was pretty interesting. Additionally, a lot of tags combine some, um, some, some of these different parameters, or you could use uh, both of the tags together. However, my research actually focuses on data storage tags that record acceleration and heart rate. So why would you want to measure acceleration or heart rate? So for example, an acceleration tag could record three-dimensional acceleration. So this part I'll have to explain a little bit. So it could record it in the y-axis, which would be forward and backward, in the z-axis, which would be up and down, and in the x-axis, which would be side to side or swaying. So in a lab, you could take these accelerometry variables and you could relate them to fish activity and behavior. Therefore, accelerometer tags can be used to estimate the activity levels of free swimming fish. As for heart rate, I'll give you a brief description of how that might be used. So this is a paper that was done in rainbow trout, and the tag here is placed close to the heart, and then it picks up the signals from the heart, and then it produces what's known as an electrocardiogram, or what I'll refer to in this talk as an ECG. And then from that, you could either use software or manually, you can help calculate heart rate in these terms. So heart rate in a fish will increase uh, when they're responding to an exhaustive stressor. Therefore, heart rate can be used as an indicator of stress, as well as an indirect measurement of so, what I'm going to do uh, for the rest of this part of the presentation is show you two examples of how these tags might be used. I looked into the literature, and this is not at all an exhaustive review, um, but I found two examples uh, that are one about salmon. 
Um, so that's what I'll be showing you guys today. I also brought the papers with me. So afterwards, if there's any questions that I can't answer, we can look them up in the papers, or if you just want to see what they're like, you can look that up too. So one of the papers is by uh, Donaldson and his colleagues that was published in 2010 in a journal called Physiological and Biochemical Physiology. They looked at adult coho salmon and they implanted them with a data storage tag known as an iLog R tag. This tag is not commercially available, but it's been um, published in a couple of um, research papers on fish, and it's 23 grams. What this records is the ECG output, uh, remember the electrocardiogram output, as well as temperature. It doesn't calculate heart rate, so they would have to put it into a software afterwards to calculate heart rate. After implanting them, they allowed the fish to recover for 24 hours. They did two experiments. So for the first experiment, they wanted to simulate a predator interaction or um, the stress that the fish might experience in grabbing a same net or gill net. So they did what's known as growling for either 10 minutes or 30 minutes. In the second experiment, they wanted to simulate a fisher's interaction. So in this case, they swam the fish to exhaustion was a mean time of 95 seconds. Or they swam them uh, to exhaustion in addition to a minute of air exposure, or they had a control. So what I'm showing you here is the results from the 10 minutes of crowding. So this is the crowding stressor. Um, they didn't actually publish a graph for the 30 minutes of crowding, but it was just written in text, so I'll explain that to you guys after. So first I'll explain the graph. What you have here is heart rate, Again, that's measured in beats per minute, and then you have time on this axis. The white circles represent all the individual fish, so that's kind of all the raw data. But the parts that we'll be looking at mostly are the black circles here, which represent the mean values. So you have the pre corralling before they uh, expose them to the tracker, the peak heart rate after corralling, and then the point at which the fish's heart rate per hour. So, from the rest to after corralling, the fish's heart rate increased from 31 to 60 beats per minute. This is an example of how, in response to stress, even a low intensity stress, fish's heart rate uh, increases in response to stress. Additionally, the important thing to note here is that heart rate took longer to recover in uh, the 30 minutes of corralling. So, when it was 30 minutes of crawling, it took them 11.5 hours for the heart rate to come back to the baseline. Whereas in the 10 minutes of crawling, it took only 7.6 hours. <laughs> and now the results from the exhaustive stress began was meant to simulate a fisheries interaction. They determined that air exposure had no effect on the stress. However, heart rate took 16 hours to recover from that exhaustive. So what should you take away from this paper? The first important thing that I mentioned for the growling stressor is that they determined that recovery depends on the duration of stressor. So even a really low intensity stress, like uh, crowding the fish together, 30 minutes is much more stressful to them than 10 minutes was. And secondly, the recovery time can be up to 16 hours for an exhaustive stress. During this 16 hour period while the fish is recovering, they can be uh, vulnerable to other stressors and other information. The second paper I'm going to share with you guys today is by Price Day et al. 2017, and this was published in Conservation Physiology. And they looked at uh, Fraser, River, Fraser River summer run sockeye salmon. They implanted them with a star audi tag, which is 12 grams, and this records ECG output heart rate, and temperature. And in this experiment, they allowed them 48 hours to recover. They only had one experiment, and what they did was after the initial recovery time, they exposed them to one of three temperatures. One is 16, one is 19, and one is 21. They chose 16 as the first because that is considered the optimal uh, temperature at which sockeye salmon can live and grow. However, they chose the maximum to be 21 uh, because at the time that they did the experiment, 21.5 was one of the maximum temperatures that was recorded in Fraser River. So after they 
they were acclimated to those temperatures. The fish were chased to exhaustion uh, in a donut-shaped tank, and this again was to simulate uh, exhaustion caused by anguish or gillar sandwiching. I have the results on the right side here, and FH just means heart rate, and again, that's in beats per minute, and this is time post stress. And again, there's the 16 3 group, 19 and 21. What you'll notice um, in the red writing is that temperature increased the peak heart rate. So it was the peak heart rate reached after the stress was 91 and 16 degrees, 105 and 19 degrees, and 117 beats per minute at 21 degrees. At 21 degrees, sockeye salmon approached their maximum upper limit for heart rate. So what this means is that past this upper limit, the fish no longer has the capacity to increase oxygen and therefore um, supply the rest of the tissues with the oxygen needed for it to continue on. Additionally, they found that temperature affected the initial rate of recovery, uh, but good to know that overall, uh, the three treatments all recovered after 10 hours. So the takeaway conclusion here is that uh, the researchers were concerned that if river temperatures continue to rise in the Fraser River, that sockeye salmon may not have the capacity to recover from exhausting stress. So what are the implications of this for conservation or catch and release? Uh, I hope that I showed you guys that data storage tags uh, can be really relevant and useful tools for measuring uh, catch and release stress in salmon species. Additionally, um, uh, physiological research has been known to actually um, or inform um, proper catch and release uh, techniques. So, for example, there's this really great movement going on uh, known as the keep them wet movement. And they've got three really simple principles, and these are based on uh, physiological research. So, first one is minimize air exposure. Secondly, you want to eliminate contact with dry surfaces. And lastly, you want to reduce the uh, You'll be aware of most of these things because they're written right into the angling guidelines these days. Um, but if anyone's more interested in the Keep Them Wet program, you can look that up um, at keepemwet.org. But this is how uh, big storage tags can be useful uh, in conservation and catch and release. And that is the end of my first time. So if anyone has any questions about that research, Said the uh, the upper limit of the heart rate was 117. I think it was 130. Yeah. How was it established? Uh, so a different researcher established that. So that was a literature lab. Sorry. It's a, li a literature lab. Yeah, it yeah. is. It's um, I think in response to increasing temperatures. Okay. So the concern is that past that point, salmon can't increase their heart rate anymore. So if the river temperatures increase anymore, and they're exposed to any type of
domāšu komplikēšanā par tieši par tehnikam bērku un tā arī. Un tas man aizsēks, ka tā esmu nolūdzu varu. Tā tehnika nav šķirta tā direkšana, bet tā vēl ir tieši tā labāk īdējīgi par kontrolēt. Tiek arī ar Yeah, I would imagine seeing an eagle fly over, and that would cause some stress, too. Absolutely, that would cause a startle response, which would cause some stress, like I said. What is for those fish that they would have a tag that's not our standard? Were they in the breeding pond? Were they fresh water? Uh, there were some around, some around adults. Some around adults with sockeye.
Um, and you mentioned a really great example, trying to get out the waterfall um, or difficult, fast, um, fast flow river. That would be stressful. Yeah. Could be a problem. That was on freshwater river. Uh, this one here? It looks like it. Oh, this picture? The pictures? No, no. It oh, mentions okay. that these were all done in r river temperatures, so obviously that would be fresh water. Okay. Yeah. But the pictures are unrelated. Just Google it. Yeah, what was over the tank? What was um, so they took the fish from the river and then they put them. Oh, I'm sorry. They put them in a donut shaped tank to exhaust them. So you could even, um, you know, you could even ask how much tank you extrapolate.
fish recovers well. Additionally, the fish is on a wet sponge, uh, and then any water that flows past the gills flow, uh, flows further towards the sponge as well. So that helps fish uh, keep fish cool. And then the last step is just to close the incision. So I'm using what's known as a continuous stitching, uh, and it's essentially the same type of one that you get if you had to get stitches in the hospital. Um,
course in coast swimming. So, as an example of this type of swimming, it's essentially similar to a startle response or some sort of escape response. So, in the top one, the fish is swimming slow, in low velocity. And on, on the bottom one, it's swimming at a higher velocity, and you'll see once the video starts, in a second, it kind of bursts forward, and so it bursts a little bit, and then after that, it kind of coasts. So, this change in acceleration from really fast to slow is making this high R value. So therefore, in a free swimming fish, I can see that value and know that the fish was um, exhibiting this behavior. But what about heart rate, the other things that I, I looked at? So in this graph, you've got a swim speed again, and it provided the resting value as well, and there's heart rate in beats per minute. And you can see that uh, with swimming speed, uh, heart rate increased from about 60 beats per minute to a maximum of 77 beats per minute at 1.6 uh, body lengths per second. But do I trust these values? This is something that's really important to the overall question of my research. So remember I showed you earlier these uh, ECGs or electrocardiograms. Uh, the software of Star Audi actually provides um, all of these measurements with something that's known as a quality index. So essentially, it's a unitless measurement that just tells me how good is the quality of these ECGs. So zero being good quality, and for whatever reason, they arbitrarily chose one, two, and three to be some form of bad quality. Um, so I can analyze uh, that data. So what I wanted to look at was how many of these recordings were considered good quality, or zero. And what I found is that even though it appears that there's a decrease in the quality during some swimming, um, with my statistical tests, I didn't find any significant change in the quality of the recordings with swimming speed. So what does all of this mean? Uh, the first conclusion is that the accelerometry parameters can be used, as I mentioned, to predict swimming speed in free swimming fish. Additionally, the high values of bar uh, are indicating that the fish is bursting coast swimming. And lastly, uh, that heart rate can be reliably recorded uh, at different swimming speeds. So I wanted to look now at free swimming fish. Um, so what I did was tag uh, 10 salmon, again with these Senti uh, heart rate acceleration tags, and I allowed them to recover for a week at 11 degrees in a big tank. And this is in what's known as the Joe Brown Aquatic Research Facility at the Ocean Science Center. And if I were to stand here, um, I'm like this tall. Um, and so that's what those fish are in there. So what I've got here is all of the possible results that I got from this one tag. Um, we don't need to focus on it too much, um, but I'm just showing you that this is all of the information I can get over the week. So there's heart rate, there's these two acceleration parameters, and then there's temperature. And you can see that during this time, the holding temperature remained constant. But I'm going to zero in on heart rate, because that's what indicates to us uh, that the fish is recovered or not. So, again, it's measuring heart rate over these seven days. These dark bars are representing uh, periods of darkness, and the light is representing uh, periods when the lights were on for the tank. And so they have a really consistent 12, like 12 hours on, 12 hours off. Uh, so, uh, again, I have um, statistical analyses based on this, and if anyone's more interested in how I did that, you can ask me at the end, or I can show you different graphs later. Uh, but what my results showed is that by roughly four days post-surgery, uh, the heart rate had sort of plateaued and recovered from the initial um, surgery. Additionally, it showed that there's a significant diagonal variation in heart rate. That All that that means is that at, in the day, uh, their heart rate's higher than at night. And that's good to see. It, it implies uh, that the fish is not very strong. So additionally, I looked at 
So this ended up with a really interesting result because now in one of the trials, temperature here ended up fluctuating in tanks. Something happened in the building and all of that temperatures fluctuated. Whereas in the other trial, temperature remained constant. So if you kind of look more at that, remember that I mentioned in my last one that I decided that heart rate had recovered by about four days uh, post-surgery. So I've got that red line there for heart rate, showing that that's where I, I thought most likely I had recovered in the one week time. But actually, at a stable temperature, it may even show that heart rate might even continue to decline into the two-week period. So this has really important implications going forward, which as um, someone has mentioned earlier, are officially recovered, and do we know that? So now going forward, before you use the tags, it's a really good idea to determine when the fish has actually recovered from the surgical stress and then do your experiments. So at this point, I would suggest uh, sometime, maybe even up to uh, a week or two weeks, might be necessary for recovery. And also, that this depends heavily on the temperature. So at a stable temperature, this is easy to see, but when the temperature is fluctuating, um, you can see that the heart rate responds pretty well to the temperature, so then it's harder to determine when the fish recovers. Additionally, I wanted to look at the quality. So this being done again, um, I just did the statistical analysis on this, and I'm happy to determine uh, that the quality of ECGs did not decrease or change significantly over the 42 days. So over those days, I can uh, trust the results that I got. But I mentioned this problem about the sutures coming on the and kind of wasting away. So this is what I was really going so, of the sutures that I put around the tag, eight of the front ones remained out of ten, and the back ones, seven out of ten remained. So, I found that a few of them um, had come undone, the, the knots that I tied, and uh, they sort of started to fall apart. For the incision, all of those had come apart, and this is really common. Um, basically, the, the incision begins to heal itself, and the sutures start to waste away. Uh, so this was common to see, and it's not such a big deal. But what was most important was that all of the tags, 10 out of 10 tags, were still with, within uh, 0.7 centimeters of the heart cavity. So basically over time, they stayed in the position they were supposed to stay in, and tissue had started growing around them, so they were close to the heart, and that they still did good measurements. So this is a good test. So my overall conclusion is that uh, star IDs, heart rate acceleration tags, seem to be an effective and reliable tool for measuring both heart rate and activity in free swimming salmon, and I hope that these tags uh, will go on to be used in multiple research fields. Thank you for coming to my talk today. Oh, it's 8.30? <coughs> Lots of time for questions.
startle response or an escape response would be the same type of behavior. So that's why it's really great to see that there's some sort of meaningful relationship there. Um, kind of you can imagine we provided the example of the eagle flying over it and receiving that eagle and then trying to swim away to hide its spot. Um, that would be the perfect example of you'd be able to recognize that behavior based on the result. Yeah. Is there an upper presentation available so that if anyone wants it, we can email. It's up to you. Let me ask my supervisor. Ah, uh, okay. I'll get back to you. Maybe I've got to publish this stuff first. I don't know. <laughs> so we have, we, it didn't go out to uh, Facebook Live tonight, but we, we, it's no harm posting it on Facebook then based on what you said, is it? Oh, sorry. It's no oh, harm. that's fine. Like, okay. Okay. But I don't know about, like, you know, putting it concretely out. As long as I'm sure there's no problem. No problem. i got to check. We won't get you in trouble. I'm not the, the PI, so... <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Zoe, thank you very much. Thank you for attending. Um,